Okay, so welcome back. This is the first part of the Rofield Models Firefly uh, kit. So this is a brand new kit. It's the M4 Sherman Firefly version, which is the uh, upgraded British one with a 16-pounder gun wedged in the turret. It just about fit. Uh, it had to weld a box on the back, I think, to make it all work. So um, it's nice to have a new uh, new release of this. It was a bit difficult to get um, the Tasca and Dragon ones that are the only ones I really knew of out there at the minute. So, as with most armor kits it's, uh, of these days, it's starting with creating the bathtub hole. Um, it's the bathtub style of hole and uh, lower hole, and you have to actually construct that yourself. I imagine they've done it like this to try and get a bit more detail in, but it's. Um, it's a bit of a silly way to go about it, if you ask me. It's They could have just moulded it as one, I would have said. But anyway, um, it creates a few problems. Um, Tamiya do this, but Tamiya being Tamiya, you don't tend to get any problems. But this one, it does kind of pull in a bit at the side, so you've, got to, you've just got to double-check everything, which is what I'm doing. So I've got the rear plate there as well um, for, the, for the lower hole. I'm just pointing out here, you've got a couple bits you've got to drill out for this version make some holes but uh, with this piece you're able to use that as a kind of spacer and make sure you get the two sides uh, square and even with that you'll see in a minute that one end square and the other end is is kind of uh, angled in a little bit uh, but it's best to get all the parts that you need so the, f the, the front section and the rear section so that as you glue them together you can make sure it is square and then you can take it off again but it's it's good to have them to hand I would say and uh, using the Tamiya extra fin cement here it uh, works very well with this plastic uh, it, it does respond extremely well you get a nice um, nice join sets very quick and you get um, a good sort of bead of plastic and there you can see that uh, this end is a little bit you know you've got to pull it out as I'm doing um, it's not a problem when you put the front section in it, it just slots in and forces it apart anyway but it's something to look out for you can see the rear section there is just dry fitted and it does, does slot in I mean for the most part this kit is very well engineered and the fit is extremely good but it's almost over engineered in a couple places I would say it's trying to do things the way sort of Tamiya does it and not not quite having the right finesse, is my opinion. And now we're making up that front section for the hole as well. So we've got a, 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 an interesting way to go about these parts. This is where the sprocket joins on. Uh, so I imagine it's um, part of the drivetrain at the front. And um, so you've got to glue in... There's something inside this bit. So it, it slots together. I can't remember what it is, but there's a there's a piece in there uh, which takes the peg for the actual sprocket in a minute so that I've had to put a piece of plastic in from the rear of that bit and that's wedged in there and then we've got this part which takes a poly cap as you can see it fits in all right and then we wedge that together to make the actual uh, I don't know what you call it axle spindle something like that where the sprocket goes on so that makes that the right length there's a bit of a weird way of going about it in the first place. I think they've tried to keep all the wheels workable, which they are workable. So I, why, I don't know, but that's what they've decided to do. And then this peg here is actually the middle section of the sprocket. So there's a weird way of going around it, because then you put the sprocket over that, glue it to that peg, and it's the peg that moves and the sprocket moves with it. But I don't know, it didn't really work very well for me. Um, I actually had to clean up the centres of it because I found I got a bit of um, a melted glue kind of come around there. But that's how they decided to do it, so there you go. And then we're getting on with the front section again. I apologise, this has got a name and I can't remember what the name of this part is. I keep wanting to say the glacius plate and it's not that, but it's something like that. It's the gearbox housing cover. <laughs> you have to bear with me uh, so this is how it goes together It's again it's very nicely done because it's got the right shape to it and it's got casting texture all over it 
and these uh, side parts slot in very nicely and you've got those uh, braces with the bolts on that I've got one on there you've got another one that's got to go on there so it's all it's all very nicely done it's just um, I don't know how to describe it slightly lacking you, you you expect it to go together perfectly and it's just not quite perfect if this was Tamiya it would be absolutely perfect this is just slightly one notch down and it is quite a complicated kit as well in places so you've just got to take your time test fit is would be my um, advice the fit will be good but you might have to just slightly test fit it and, and modify it uh, one way or another but we're talking very minor things here and there you go it's all, all together looking pretty good and there's one of those uh, bracing bars going on there And uh, important here not to, is to try and force that into where it wants to be before you glue it, otherwise you'll get a kind of bead of plastic come out around it, which you don't really want. So just something to watch out for. And where those bits overhang the lip as well, it's just worth checking that with the upper hole to make sure they're at the correct point, because it's you know there's a little bit of movement. It could be a little bit further up or a little bit lower down. But there we go, it does work, as I said, as you, as you get to this point, it just slots right in. It's um, That's very impressive, and a good way of doing it. So I was very happy with that. And then that pretty much gets the lower hole construction all together. And then we've got these uh, blanking off parts for the underneath of the upper hole. Uh, it's the bit uh, over, uh, over the track that goes. It's not really a track guard, it's, it's part of the upper hole. And older kits used to have this, um, uh, it'd be a gap so you could see up inside it. So I imagine that's to uh, counter that. And then we start adding some of the detailed parts. This is all on the rear, uh, rear, rear part of the hole. A little bit of photo etch going on there. Some, a uh, few sort of, not really fiddly, but small brackets. And you can see you've got like a tow hook there and, and all of the parts are on. And it starts to give it quite a lot of uh, finesse, really. It's a very well detailed kit, packed full of it, especially with the uh, large photo etch for it that you get. Uh, then it's time to uh, attack the wheels. Now these are the idlers, and you'll see what will happen here. It's a bit of a ridiculous problem. Uh, it shows the the difficulties with the plastic. It's it's a soft plastic as far as when the glue attacks it, but it also is quite a hard, brittle plastic at the same time. It's very strange. And here where I've pushed on one side of the wheel, uh, well, one side of the actual, um, it's not a rubber bit, it's a metal rim. It's cracked. As soon as I've touched it with the Tamiya Extra Fin, it's just cracked. And why they've done it in two sections, I'll never know, because there's not going to be a seam there in the middle. Really, really weird idea and strange choice for that. Uh, anyway, so I pushed them to both together, rammed them on there and piled in the super glue to kind of fill the seam and and hope for the best. But a very, very strange idea that with the idler. I, I don't know what they were after there. Uh, you could almost argue that the sprocket's in the same um, s sort of ballpark as well. We've got these nasty um, ejector pin marks on the inside of uh, the, the sprocket, which you can see when the tracks are on. So that's a pain. I did try and take them off, but I, I couldn't be bothered in the end, really. <laughs> I just sort of left it. There you can see the crack filled with super glue on the idlers. Very odd. So uh, it's, it's fine in the end of it, but it's just a really strange way of going about it. Uh, surely they could have done that either, but just moulded it as one or I don't know. Anyway, that's how they did it. And then we're... Um, so I like to get the wheels out of the way and get them all prepped. And then it was on to continuing with the rear part. So we're going on approaching the kind of exhaust and um, I suppose this would be the air outlet from the engine or the air intake, one of the, one of the two. Um, we've got exhaust out there as well. Uh, so that's like a radiator type. I don't know what I'm saying here. Well, as you know, it's like an air intake with grills in it. And then we've got this large photo etch grill that goes on the inside of it. So that's just what I'm doing at the minute. Uh, just getting that prepped. 
and uh, it's a really nice piece. The photo etch is lovely. It's really, really thin and um, well designed. It's uh, it's really crisp. Quite impressive. And there you go. You can see as you look up there, you've got the grill. So it's an air intake. That's why there's a grill there. So uh, that's looking pretty good. Now, the exhausts must be in there as well, actually, thinking on it. Anyway, who knows? Um, so now we're on to the tracks. This is something I've left uh, as the kind of full way of me doing it, so I'm not skipping any parts here. These are extremely complex, uh, probably over-engineered, but I must admit, once you've done all the work, I was sort of driving myself mad at this point, thinking, well, this is going to take a long time. It did, I suppose. It took one evening to do both set of tracks. It wasn't that difficult. Um, it's really quite impressive. When you've got them done, I think they're better, the, the best way you could go about it. Now, you, there's an argument whether rubber tracks would do the same thing on a Sherman and it wouldn't matter. Probably. And I, I would agree with that, even with this point. But if you persevere with these and stick to it, they're a brilliant set of tracks at the end. They're strong, uh, they're detailed, and they're very nice, very good, workable, good sort of weight to them, and they work really well. Uh, the downside of this is you don't get any spare um, pins at all. In, uh, I, I dropped a couple and rolled over them with the chair and they broke. Thankfully, I didn't chuck them in the bin because towards the end I had to fix them to reuse them to get the right amount of tracks. So I thought that was a bit strange. Could have at least given you a sort of spare run of each. So you've got six spare tracks or something. But no, there's literally... I say that, I think there's two I've found uh, since doing these. I think I've found another, another two on the floor. But that's it. And two is just enough to do one extra run. Uh, one extra link, sorry. So it's not enough. Uh, but anyway, there you go. You're using the jig. You've got all of this. So um, you lock in the bottom parts. Then you lock in the side parts, uh, the, the pins, sorry. And then uh, on my review, a very helpful chap left a comment saying to use super glue. And I'm not sure I would have thought about that. And he's quite right, because you just put super glue around the um, peg there. And uh, it's plenty to hold it. Whereas if you were to use extra thin, it would run all into the pins and not work. So uh, that was a great piece of advice. And I've, uh, I've used that and I'm passing it on to you. So really good. So once you've got the top parts clamped on, that pulls the um, pins in and locks them together. So then we can take off uh, the sprue gates and think about um, undoing the clamps. So you've got little pegs here that I've just found these tweezers just unclipped quite well. And once they slide out, the track becomes free and you can just lift it off and it's workable. <coughs> And there you go, so that's six of 86, was it? <laughs> or 90, something like that, per run. So it's a, it's a long task. It's um, tricky, mind-numbing. It's not as quick as just pushing two links together and gluing them and setting them up. Uh, there's a lot to it. If you were to go down uh, the route of getting any of the other... Meng also almost do exactly this way of doing it as well. Um, so if you go down the route of getting any of the Shermans with duck bills on them, you then at this point would have to add the duck bills. So uh, it seems a bit ridiculous to me. But anyway, that's that's how they've chosen to do it. And when you want to join them together, um, it looks it, I'm making it look tricky. Once you get it right, it does actually clip in and it stays. Uh, and I'm showing you this warts and all for that reason. So when you push them both in and you get the... Um, pins sorted <laughs> it is fiddly i got the knack of it i didn't realize that it clipped in at this point you've got to kind of slide it in one end there it's clipped in now and it's a lot more solid and then it clips in with this one and it's actually not going to go very far now uh, so you just got to persevere and there is a, a little slot underneath um, underneath that kind of bit that joins the two pins together on the sides if you get it in under there it slots in lovely and then you get your uh, top part in, clamp it down with the super glue, instant, and that's it, and on you go. And 
in true fashion in in a minute we're going to see some that I uh, did earlier hopefully and we'll see it around the sprocket as well uh, they're a little bit stiff but you can loosen them up um, with a little bit of movement once you get the whole run on uh, they do loosen up uh, quite well and as you see I mean they go round the, uh, the sprocket no problem but they are a little bit stiff in places but I found that that sort of went away when you joined them to the extra extra runs of links. So I'd actually already done a whole set at this point. You can see they're a lot more uh, movable. There's none of that stiffness there because the weight of the track ahead of it sort of pulls it into whatever direction. So it, very impressive. Really, really good. But, you know, don't be, um, don't fool yourself. It's quite a uh, job. But you just got to kind of get into it. Uh, another job <laughs> is the bogeys. Not too bad, to be honest. You can kind of set up a production line here like I've done. Get all the parts cleaned up and just just make them and, um, and just get on with it. So you've got springs that go into the actual part, which is uh, spring loaded in the bogey, which does make them workable. Um, there's parts... Uh, specific to each side so you want to keep an eye on that and I just did one side first and then did the other side afterwards um, and the actual uh, parts where the wheels join which are these bits just in the top corner um, I left them to the end I wanted to paint them first so I could get the rubber rims around the uh, tires so uh, I bagged those up to make sure I had the right side but you could do it once you got your eye in you could work out which one's which anyway uh, because they're kind of uh, sided if that makes sense they've they've got bits that only work on one side or the other side <coughs> uh, so how i went about it is gluing these springs in like this and then um, bring that together to these uh, rocker rockers sort of thing i don't know what they what they'd be called they're the, they're the parts that take the uh, smaller bogies that have the wheels in them so i got those two together clamped like that and then I found it was it made sense to just clamp them into the bogey here, one of the sides of it. And you kind of force it up there and it slots in. It's hard to to explain and show, but if you do it, this this peg on the on the end here slots into something there. So if you actually get it in the um in the right way it'll it'll hold. I know it's fallen out there. <laughs> Another way of doing it is to just um <laughs> Again, I, I'm laughing because I'm showing you this all uh, warts and all because it's just falling apart. It, it's just to make the point of how fiddly it is, uh, which, it, you know, it is quite fiddly. But once you get it up in there, you can just push it up and it slots in and you can clamp it together then, which is what I do here a bit more successfully. So with it clamped, you give it a push there in the spring and then hold it together. Easier said than done. I did again. The first one was difficult. The last one I did in seconds. It, you, you do get a knack for it. But it is just showing you how overly complicated this is. And I'm not sure it needs to be this. Because I don't think you need to have the springs workable. I mean, why? What's the point? I don't understand it. There's no need for the wheels to work. There's no need for the springs to work. I apologise for it going out of focus here. But you, I'm sure you can understand. I'm trying to work with it. Usually I edit this down, but I just want to show you just how fiddly it is. Once you get it sorted like this, and I've got it clamped together and I'm holding it, then I've put the um, return roller on. Um, then you get some glue on it, <laughs> hold the damn thing with a clamp, and forget all about it, and it's okay then. It's a trusty old Tamiya then, again, Tamiya Extra Fin. It's running in there. Clamp the damn thing down like that. line it up and uh, hope for the best and go over the top with the glue <laughs> make sure there's enough in there to hold it uh, and uh, then the next thing is we've got horrible seam lines but uh, the good thing with a Sherman is you can just plaster them with Mr. Surfacer and uh, make it look like cast texture which is what I did you get a seam there on the front section here's one I did earlier so you can see how it's workable. You've got the return rollers on there again with the uh, 
the, the bar on there, I suppose, which is part of the return roller return guidance as well. And there's the seam on the end. So I just uh, plastered that with Mr. Surfacer. Then we're on to the uh, wheels, which is again a little bit um, not complicated, but there's plenty of seam lines there to take care of. There's a lot of work. And um, they've again split it, so you've got the inner section of the part that faces out um, that you glue in, and it's a little bit tight. And again, I don't know what the benefit of moulding that separately is. I, you know, I'm not. That's not my game, so I'm sure there's a reason to it. That's why they've done it. But it, it's very tight, very stiff, quite hard to line up. But when you um, when you get it right, it's okay, and it's important to. Uh, point out the part actually this is the rear bit this bit the front bit has got um, two bolts in it which uh, show out so you've got to make sure you've got the the side facing out which has the two bolts in those recesses and then just again plaster it with Tammy extra fin and force it down again and hope it's in the right place it's just Slightly vague, that's the trouble. I mean, I, I don't know, is that over-engineering or bad um, planning? or It's one or the other. You can see the seam line on the tyre as well, but all, all kits suffer from that. That's just a thing you've got to get rid of. Simple enough, just blast through it with sanding sticks. And again, plenty of wheels on the Sherman, so they've all got to be done. And then we uh, move on to the upper hole. So uh, I've got the doors on and the periscope sorted. I've drilled out some holes from the underneath to uh, put on some of these fixings on the front plate. All is uh, very nicely detailed. I've decided to use the actual kit guards for the periscopes instead of the uh, photo etch ones, which are a bit flat. And uh, they're not flat, really. They're, they're a little bit rounded. It's the lesser of two evils, really. You either have them too flat or too sort of thick. But it's fine. I went for the rounded option. Uh, we've got fiddly spare tracks here, which have photo etch air uh, sort of uh, what would I call those fittings fixings. That's how they um, they slot into those rails, I suppose, and they go on the uh, front plate of the hull. And I did look these up, and this is actually very good to have these in photo etch because they are extremely thin in real life, so that's probably uh, very much like it. There, there's a guard here. I think I, um, on looking this uh, Sherman at this variant, the British didn't really go very well, very, very much on machine guns, from what I can tell. So uh, the the one in the front plate has been welded over it looks like and uh, there's no 50 cal on the turret either whereas the americans go mad for the uh, machine guns so starting um to sort out the photo etch here and i thought it was worth just showing you how i do the fo uh, use the photo etch bender so this is the original one this is from way back when it first came out uh, mission models uh, easy etch mate that's what it is i bought this when i was i don't know i must have been like 16 something like that because uh, I was using lots of photo etch. I've kept it ever since and it's uh, stood the test of time. So I've just put, the, you, you basically put the piece of uh, photo etch in and clamp it down and make sure that the crease uh, that's, that's already in there is in that trench and then you slide under it with these kind of plastic uh, versions of standing knife blades I suppose, that sort of thing and um, once you've got it positioned, you just slide it underneath and you can fold it up. And this is almost too small for this. So the way to do it is actually you, you sort of get under it and then push it. But for, for longer pieces, uh, it's simple. You just put it there and it just slots straight up and um, folds exactly where it needs to. Now you can see it's absolutely tiny, that piece of metal. Um, I've still got the little nibs on there, which I do actually sand off before I glue them on crazy stuff really absolutely <laughs> it's just um very very small i don't know what it is it might be a sort of rain guard or something like that to stop the water running down into an area i'm not sure but it goes on the front plate there in between that weld bead 
and it is on the real vehicle I, I looked it up again it, no idea of what it's used for but it is there and then a, a brilliant addition is to have the photo etch light guards because it's one of the main parts on a Sherman that really do need to be photo etched it's very hard to mould them in plastic to get them to look any sense really um, and we get a nice jig for this uh, which works quite well you kind of bend it over it's kind of I don't know it doesn't quite work how it should you've got to pin it both sides really uh, but you get the you get the general shape and then you can just uh, bend the actual sort of middle of it um, a little bit more but you, you get a nice curve at the top instead of a sharp point which you'd get if you tried to do that yourself I think and uh, you can actually pull it together once you glue it on with super glue and force it into the section and there you go you see how impressive that is really good and you get the both ones on the front and the rear ones uh, you get all the ones you need and then you've got uh, grills here on the uh, intakes as well on the upper part of the hole again could be outlets don't know could be the exhausts I don't know where the exhausts are on this uh, so let me know in the comments below I'm not not up on my Shermans um, I've built the Easy 8 which obviously has exhaust at the back uh, this I couldn't see where the exhausts are so maybe this is them this is the uh, it's a different hole this I think the Mark V Sherman not sure so I won't say what I think it is because it's obviously wrong if you could let me know because it's M4 A1 A2 A3 and A4 holes I think isn't it um, like I said let me know down in the comments I'd be interested to read what you say it's again brilliant fit there just slot straight in so uh, where Ryfield get it right it does um, it goes together really well just like I said, just you know, approach things with a bit of caution and just test it things here and there. Uh, and now it's time to get this uh, rear deck sorted, and they will just slot in, no problem. It's nice to see that sort of thing, isn't it? Once you get this far, and once it's been designed like that, you hope that those parts go together nicely. Uh, there's a bit of a gap there uh, between the joints, but once you glue it, they do actually that does disappear. It comes together quite well, so don't worry too much about that. And then we've got the rear deck and um, stowage box on the back there, and this brings it all to an end. Uh, so we've just got the lid that clips on, and then we've got photo etch uh, buckles, no padlocks on this which is a nice touch, gives it a bit of finesse, there you go, just get them around that, uh, that loop, and they give it a real nice um, touch of detail, it's a nice thing to have added into a kit, straight out of the box, I mean this is usually uh, aftermarket territory, uh, now there's very vague placements, I have no idea what these parts are, but these plastic set of squares need to be glued onto the side of the hole. Um, they are there and they are on the uh, real version, I was, using, uh, part, uh, I was using photos from the one at Bovington, which is a Mark 5C, and it's all, everything that this kit asks for is on there. It got the rear deck sorted as well, added all the photo etch clasps and the uh, tool handles and... Um, Sorry, uh, 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 tool clamps and that sort of thing. And I decided to make this a fenderless version. But all the fenders are in, so you can use the front fenders and the side fenders. Or you can take them all off, and you've got the photo etch uh, parts to add that show where the bolts go through. So you can go one or the other, and I decided to use those. As I like to... Uh, I can only really see ones with fenders that it just almost sort of rolled off... Um, rolled off the ship on the beach. That was the best I could sort of see of it, really. But I'm sure they used all sorts of combinations. And you see just how much photo etch is in this kit. There's, there's plenty of it around. So it's, uh, it's good to see that from these modern kits. 
And then the turret is very straightforward. Um, there is a join at the back, which I've plastered here with uh, Mr. Surfacer. That's the old trick that really hides all the sins. You can just uh, do the old cast texture technique, stipple it on with a brush. That's Mr. Surfacer 1200. And um, uh, all is well then. It hides, hides everything. Can't do that with aircraft, unfortunately. And we've got that uh, back box there as well, which is where that's one of the modifications for the Firefly. And the usual thing with this, all the fittings uh, you know, went no problem. Fitted on nicely. And then um, you drill a couple of holes and this uh, extra stowage box goes on to the back of that as well. Which gives it a strange kind of uh, look. Makes it uh, almost cancel out the gun a little bit. Because it goes so far up the back end. It's quite a unique feature. The Firefly is very nice. It's a nice one to have. It's kind of different enough, where it's still a Sherman, but not quite. I've got the machine gun on and upside down here, but I don't think it matters. You're not going to see inside, but that should be the other way around. I thought it went in like this. <laughs> but when I offered it up, I realised it had to be the other way. But very nice fit again. Slot straight in. And there we go. So uh, in the next um, video, we'll be uh, dealing with the paint and the decaling. So this is part one and we'll bring it to an end in part two. So thanks for tuning in. And um, if you haven't already, consider subscribing and I'll see you in the next video.